a brief treatment of uh, al khamisa ashara, the 15th defect, al ghiba. He says this requires lengthy investigation. Ghiba is backbiting. And as we'll see, there's complex issues here of criticizing people for opinions that they might hold, which in an academic context or religious context might be valid, or criticizing people in order to warn others of their danger. Don't buy from such and such a shopkeeper because he cheated me last week. Is that backbiting or is it necessary to alert other people um, to a danger? It's actually a complex topic. So let's just begin with it. فَلْنَذْكُرْ أَوَّلًا مَذَمَّةَ الْغِيبَةِ وَمَا وَرَدَ فِيهَا مِنْ شَوَاهِدِ الشَّرَةِ Let's begin, as he normally does, with proof texts from Revelation. وَقَدْ نَصَّ اللَّهُ سُبْحَانَهُ عَلَى ذَنْبِهَا فِي كِتَابِهِ Allah has explicitly condemned it in his book. وَشَبَّهَ صَاحِبَهَا بِآكِلِ لَحْمِ الْمَيْتَ And has likened the one who engages in backbiting with somebody who eats dead flesh, eats carrion. فَقَالَ تَعَالَى وَلَا يَغْتَبْ بَعْضُكُمْ بَعْضًا أَيُحِبُّ أَحَدُكُمْ أَنْ يَأْكُلَ لَحْمَ أَخِيهِ مَيْتًا فَكَرِهْتُمُ Let not one of you backbite another. Would one of you wish to eat the flesh of his dead brother, you would surely detest that. وقال عليه السلام كل المسلم على المسلم حرام دمه وماله وإرضه. The Prophet said, every aspect of the Muslim is sacrosanct for every other Muslim, his blood and his property and his honor. And uh, the Imam will explain that this is therefore a sharia issue and indeed backbiting can be subject to legal sanction uh, by the decree of a, a qadi it's not just an ethical slip um, it's also uh, legally actionable because one is as it were confiscating something from somebody else it's a kind of theft it's a moral theft uh, and Ayr is in most of the systems of islamic jurisprudence one of the objects of Islamic law, one of the uh, ends which it aims to protect. And in contemporary language, we might say it's a right. These are human rights, these usul, these five principles, that the sharia exists to uh, protect five rights. The right to life, the right to property, the right to lineage, stroke family, the right to religion and the right to dignity or honor, which is erd, which is what this is talking about. And this is uh, notoriously in every legal system, one of the hardest things to police. So um, it raises issues such as uh, uh, common law offenses in England, such as uh, slander and libel, which can be treated very seriously by the courts. Compensation can be uh, astronomical. It's a, a major crime in contemporary as in medieval law. Uh, but actually determining what is fair comment and what is libel is famously technical and difficult. And in the Sharia, uh, generally it's left not to the details of the fiqh, but to the discretion of the qadi, which is a, a, a standard feature of the operation of Islamic law. And in parenthesis, it's important to remember this, that most of Islamic law is in what the Qadis actually do and their rulings, and is in the fatwas of the various jurists. Most of Islamic law is not in the books of fiqh. The books of fiqh are not statutory law. And very often we Muslims, and certainly non-Muslims, when they look at Islamic law or Sharia law, this new term that they've invented, assume that to find it, you have to look in the law books of classical Islam. So you look in Imam al-Ghazali's Basit, or you look at um, Shirazi's um, Muhaddab, or any of these other big texts, um, the, the Hidayah. Uh, and that is Islamic law, but that's actually not the case at all. 
because uh, Islamic law is effective insofar as it is actually administered and the judge, the Qadi, has much more powers of discernment and determination and also the fixing of penalties and punishments than is the case uh, for a judge in the Western system. You could say Islamic law is more fluid and more, you could even say, uh, libertarian in this sense. It's less prescriptive. Uh, and the judge has the books of fiqh uh, to refer to, and he will probably have collections of fatwas on his shelves. But when it comes down to an individual case, um, it will be the decision of the judge. There's no jury, remember. Uh, it will be the decision of the judge uh, to determine whether a crime has been committed. And except in the six or seven cases of had punishment, murder, adultery, and so forth, um, the actual nature of the punishment, uh, incarceration or some other penalty, is left to the Qadi and is not specified in the books of fiqh. It's important, I think, always for us to remind ourselves of this, that the classical manuals of Sharia are not law books, as the modern West would understand them. Uh, so in this context, it would be the Qadi who would determine whether uh, somebody's honor has been infringed. And that's actually pretty wise and even essential when you think about it, because that's such a culturally specific and relative idea that the judge, who has to be from the community, has to understand the subtleties of the community and what's likely to be implied in, say, a hostile newspaper article or in uh, an angry exchange over a boundary dispute or whatever it might be. It's only the Qadi who can determine whether speech actually has infringed somebody's erd, somebody's uh, honor. Uh, a faraway theorist writing a book of statutory law would never be able to determine that. Uh, and this is one of the strengths of the Sharia. Um, if you look at Wa'il Halak's new book, The Impossible State, he says Islamic law, even though he himself is Christian Palestinian, he says Islamic law is probably the most subtle and brilliant legal system that's ever existed, but it's not understood, least of all, by the Muslims themselves because it was never statutory law. It was always uh, law administered by the Qadis, and Muslims nowadays tend to have forgotten that. Uh, so uh, the good fit which the law had with individual societies made Islamic law actually quite different in its application and its temper from culture to culture, from class to class, from region to region. Um, it's one of the things that strikes one when you read Ghazali is how really 95% of it is still directly relevant to ourselves. And the, the gut reaction that most people have when they read the Ihya is that, oh, this is terribly, it's not that it's very exotic and strange and irrelevant, but it seems terribly severe, that he requires great feats of tahajjud and fasting and a very austere type of social model. But in fact, if you read through all of these sections to the end, you'll find that his rhetorical method is always to uh, be tough at the outset, but then to give an alternative perspective and to recommend the middle way. And as we've seen in this uh, discussion that we've been through in some detail on lying, uh, he begins by saying it's haram and it's the foundation of nifaq. And then he nuances it by explaining, well, there are circumstances in which uh, lying can be permissible and even required. So what's required is the middle way. And that's where our conscience comes in and our humanity because uh, most of these issues cannot be determined uh, in detail by outsiders prescribing responses for us. It's a judgment call as to whether a lie is actually justifiable in a particular situation. So for instance, the hadith where um, he says you can tell a lie in uh, the situation where somebody has suffered an offense or an outrage. So for instance, if somebody has been abused as a child and they always thought it was their father and that made it much worse. If the counselor can say, actually, it wasn't your father, it was somebody else, that's telling a lie. But that's exactly what the Holy Prophet wasallam, is saying is a permissible and even a praiseworthy form of lying. But to know exactly when one can do that is a judgment call. And that's where the conscience, the damir, comes in. Uh, the individual human sensibility as to what's right. And it is in that area uh, that we are most fully morally accountable.
we can follow rules and obey laws and uh, get the fiqh practices right, but our humanity is engaged most on those issues where we can see that there's two sides and we have to somehow find uh, an appropriate balance in what may well seem to be the grey areas which populate so much of our moral experience. And that's part of the appeal of Imam al-Ghazali's Ihya. On the one hand, stern, absolute, um, it's a, an austere program for personal self-transformation. And he'd been through the mill himself in his own life. Um, uh, but at the same time, it's very alert to human weakness and to the need to see the Sharia and the Sunnah for what they really are, which is practical and compassionate templates for human judgment and human life. These are not detailed blueprints that screw us down to some externally imposed set of values. Instead, it is a treasure trove of dictums of principles of different opinions of legal practices which it is ultimately up to us or if we're in a uh, jurisdiction up to the qadi or the mufti to determine and there's always a plurality of opinions and imam al-ghazali is, is particularly keen that we should recognize those in humility and that we should uh, uh, respect them so uh, this is from, from the Ihya, you can really learn, paradoxically perhaps, much of the wisdom and the depth of the Sharia. It's not a law book at all, even though at the outset it has basic information from a Shafi'i perspective on arkanal wudu. Uh, but that's not really the purpose of the book. The purpose of the book is to explore the way in which revelation reaches into our humanity in a way that we can deal with and that makes us more human in the Adamic rather than the demonic sense. It's not trying to turn us into bloodless, passionless uh, angels. Instead, it's turning us into full human beings. And what's most characteristic about our humanity is the ability to look compassionately at a situation where an absolutist might say, you can never lie but in fact to see that there can be contexts where that's required and this nuance is, is very characteristic of Ghazali it comes to some extent from his Shafi'i perspective where the Shafi'is were amongst the first to indicate different gradations of what's preferable what's mustahab and so forth but it's it it's generally part of the the Sharia of Islam and it's a wisdom that often escapes us because in our time uh, Frequently, we adhere to religion in a reactive way. That is to say, we feel our identity is threatened uh, and we're being insulted by outsiders, usually powerful outsiders, and therefore the religious choices that we reach for will be particularly rigorous and tight and reactive ones. And that's very common amongst Muslims nowadays. They feel that the Western world is against them and Israel is dreadful and so on and so on. And therefore, as a protest, they adopt the narrowest possible interpretations and also adopt this very un-Islamic idea that the Sharia can become statutory law and the legal code of a nation state. And as Wa'il Halak points out in his book, that's an impossibility. The Sharia is not statutory law. It's, a, it's far too diverse and subtle uh, a legal tradition uh, and it's not designed to be imposed by a state because the state doesn't have any right to legislate in Islam. The, gov the ruler is simply there to defend the borders and to appoint judges to have his name recited in the khutbah but he is not there to legislate. Only Allah legislates. The scholars interpret the legislation and the sharia is this enormously broad range of uh, different interpretations. This is important for us to remember because very often modern Muslims in this reactive mode, which is the kind of inner state which Imam Ghazali uh, disliked so much, uh, automatic reactive protest religion, uh, much of the rhetoric nowadays is to treat Islamic law as though it was statutory legislation, which is a Western concept which is completely alien to our tradition. So they end up with a kind of totalitarianism. What about like, the ordinance with texts like the Majad and other things? Like, they didn't... Yeah, I mean, that, that's a good point. The Ottomans in the late 19th century 
felt under pressure to move beyond the traditional constitutional arrangement whereby the Sultan sat in his palace and led the armies but didn't legislate and to unify the, law call, uh, the, the legal codes of the empire in order to facilitate Turkey's integration into the European system of nation states and to facilitate trade and commerce. It was proving difficult to have a network of courts where different judgments were being given in different courts because the Qadis were all completely independent. And Western merchants, when they went to Turkey, wanted to make sure that they could sign contracts which were enforceable uh, the same way by every Qadi and every court in the empire. So uh, the Ottomans instituted a series of reforms which essentially made the states the kind of supreme mujtahid choosing which ahkam to follow. And they put it all together in this book called the Majalla, Majalli Ahkami Adliya, which was the first attempt to turn Islamic law into statutory law. But you could also say that it was a bogus exercise because as soon as it becomes statutory law, it's no longer Islamic law. It's, it's, it's brought into a completely different statist model, um, a top-down model of the imposition of law, rather than the Qadis being appointed by local communities and the law, as it were, being part of the community's own exegesis of the, of the, 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 the revealed legacy. But, of course, they had a difficult situation. What does one do? Um, you want to have legislation that fits your uh, religious heritage and identity but on the other hand the tradition tells you quite strictly that islamic law can never be statutory law so what do you do if you're running a modern nation state um, nobody has a clear answer to that